So I don't know if you guys noticed, but uh, the Pope was in the United States last week. I don't. I know a lot of you guys don't watch the news. Um, but to me, the most interesting part was I have these two friends who are not Catholic, um, uh, and I, I absolutely respect and love them, but I don't really have a lot of contact with them anymore. And one of them is this Buddhist who. He's a Buddhist, and he's like a real Buddhist, not like, you know, get these kind of American Buddhism where it's, um, I'm spiritual but not religious kind, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, no, I mean, that's ridiculous when people say that. And he's a Buddhist, but like he's a real Buddhist. And he had just gone over to um, Asia because of the earthquakes, and he's coming back, and he catches all this stuff about... Um, uh, the Pope, and he's not even Catholic, but he has just a heart full of love. And he sends me this email about how much he loves the Pope, and in it he says, this is my Pope. <laughs> like, you know, I just, I, I love that, that he could love the Pope. Um, and then another friend of mine who I don't speak to very often anymore, but great guy, um, uh, he's just retiring, so he's talking to me. I hate him for that. Um, but one of the kindest, sweetest people, he just has no anger in his heart. Uh, kind of an engineer type and still a decent person. Um, <laughs> but like, he never says anything harsh about anyone. He just doesn't have it in him. Um, and kind of like, um, like the worst he could say is, well, he's not a very nice person. For him, that's a blistering condemnation. Um, and believe me, I can go a lot more darker than that. Um, but he's just one of these people who doesn't have any anger. He's not religious, per se. Um, he had great parents, knew his parents. Um, but they were just not religious. And he calls, and he's retiring, and he says the same line. He says, this is my pope. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny because he's not religious at all, and he loves his pope. And just that odd thing. And so I was thinking about it, that two non-Catholics um, love the Pope. And I think the reason why is that this Pope has such little ego. Uh, I think Pope Francis, he doesn't have a lot of ego. I know everybody's rolling out the red carpet, but he doesn't need any of that stuff. I think somehow he died to his ego, and all he really wants to do is love other people. Um, and that attracts a lot of people. But when you have some religious authority that just has to keep pushing their own authority, be, you know, worshipped and honored, nobody's attracted to that. People are attracted by humility and love, or the ability to love. Except to really love, you have to cut out your ego. And that is exactly the point of today's gospel. To enter into life, to really love other people, you have to cut out your ego. And there's a problem in the gospel where the disciples are going along and they see this guy casting out evil in the name of Jesus. Except the problem is, he's not part of their group. He doesn't recognize their authority. So they go to Jesus and complain to Jesus that this guy is casting out evil, but doesn't recognize their authority. And like, do you see what the problem is? The problem is that they're not thrilled that evil is getting cast out of the world. Their problem is that their authority isn't getting recognized. Their egos aren't getting stroked. Not the fact that good is being done and life is happening. They're upset because it doesn't honor them. So Jesus says, um, you know, cut it out. Anybody who's not against us is for us. That the guy is doing good and bringing life in the name of Jesus, but yeah, he's not part of their little circle. And the apostles are concerned about their authority. And like, just going back to Pope Francis, Pope Francis has kind of this unboundary personality. And I know I just made up a word, but did you guys catch that? Because I know, so, I mean, but I love, I just, I don't know why I thought of it unboundary personality. You know, like, um, there's certain people who, you know, it's got to be Democrats or Republicans, or Catholics or 
this, or, you know, they, they live in these harsh boundaries, and they only love and care for those people within their boundaries. That's what I meant by it. Pope Francis just seems to love everybody. And the apostles in today's gospel, they're upset because this guy is outside of our boundaries, and he doesn't honor our authority. And Jesus tells them to cut it out. And basically what Jesus is making a point is, yes, you are the 12 apostles, but you don't own me. Um, the church does not own Christ. Christ owns the church. Uh, Christ is not the instrument of the church. We're the instruments of Christ. And Christ can work outside the church just as much as he can work through and in the church. Does that make sense? So his next part is that he's just telling them, die to your ego. Cut it out. Because the next part after he, he says, uh, you know, leave him alone. He's doing good. The next part is a non sequitur. It doesn't really follow when he starts cut, talking about a cup of water and a big stone tied around your neck and cutting off your... It, it doesn't, it's a squirrel comment. You know what that is? Like from the movie Up? Squirrel! Um, which my staff accuses me of doing all the time. But, you know, they go to Jesus to complain because this guy doesn't recognize our authority. And Jesus pulls one of these squirrel... Because he starts talking about cup of water and stone and cutting off something. But it really does follow. Everything he's talking about is about dying to your ego. The apostles think the problem is this guy doesn't recognize us. That's not the problem. The problem is you need to cut out your ego. That's what those three things talk about. Uh, like about giving water. When he says, I tell you, even if you give a cup of water, you will be rewarded. Uh, the water symbolizes giving life. No matter how small the act, even like a cup of water to the small ones, that will be rewarded. And Jesus mentions about this idea of giving life, even a small amount, a cup of water, you'll be rewarded for. Because Jesus is literally walking his way to Jerusalem, and he's about to die. He's about to die on the cross, literally pouring out his life for other people. And that's real religion. Real religion is not about, you know, um, recognized authority powers. It's about giving life away. And that's what the apostles can't do. Or the second one about the millstone. And a millstone, just to let you know, is about 2,000 pounds. It's a big rock. And he said, he says strange things. That rather than scandalize one of these little ones, it would be better if you tied a millstone, a 2,000 pound, around your neck and throw it in the river. Uh, that's a harsh condemnation. Because when he says one of these little ones, it doesn't necessarily mean children. It can. But it means the vulnerable, the poor, the children, the sick, and the weak. Even the weak of faith, such as, no event, like my friend who's non-religious, if... Authority figures are only concerned about that you recognize their authority. The people on the fringe of faith, they're going to be turned away. They're the ones who are weak. Does that make sense? You will scandalize them. And Jesus is twisting it by saying, you think the scandal is that they don't recognize your authority? The scandal is that you're weakening their faith with your need for your ego to be stroked. It would be better if you tied a millstone around your neck and be thrown into the river. Um, by the way, he's not just talking about bishops and priests. He's talking about everybody. I just realized you might think I'm just talking about Pope Francis hierarchy. I'm talking about everybody. When I was, um, um, I have seen it in the church with priests and newly ordained priests, but also like somebody becomes head of some ministry and suddenly, that ministry can't work unless you adore the ego of the person that's in charge. Or, as at this one parish once, where um, the secretary was like that. The parish secretary had such a huge ego. For you to get anything done, a funeral or a wedding, she demanded a, a pound of flesh that you stroke her ego. She was a tyrant. She wasn't concerned about giving life. She was concerned about her ego getting stroked. And Jesus says, if, you're, if that's your faith, 
It's a scandal to the weak of faith. It'd be better if you tied a 2,000 rock around your neck and throw it in the river. Or the last one is actually my favorite, even though it's harsh, where he says um, about cutting out, cutting off your hand or gouging out your eye, at least you go into Gehenna. You have to know what Gehenna is. Gehenna sometimes gets translated as hell, but that's technically not what it is. Gehenna is this garbage dump that was outside of Jerusalem in this valley. And to prevent like infectious things getting out of control, it was always kept burning. Does that make sense? So it's this garbage dump that is always burning. And the reason why the Jews chose Gehenna as a garbage dump is that before that, it was a place where pagans would uh, sacrifice babies to the god Moloch. And the Jews, being very concerned about life, that that's a place of death. That's a place that took innocent life away, so they won't use it for anything. So they turned it into a garbage dump to be kept burning constantly. Um, so Gehenna is this place of death where life is sucked away. Um, and he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Better to enter into life, the kingdom of God, missing one hand, than enter into Gehenna. And he says that about the eye, the hand, the foot. What do those mean? Like the hand, in case you don't know, the hand, your hands always symbolize your work. If all your work is about you getting your ego stroke, cut it off. You know, our egos are very dear to us, but, and it would be very painful, but better to cut it off than enter into death. You have to cut out your ego to enter into life. If you really want to enter into life and truly love all people, it demands detachment from your uh, ego. Um, so, or the eye, the eye is just the way you see the world. And maybe you're seeing the world in a very selfish, bigoted, prejudiced way. It might be tough, but gouge it out. The way you enter into life is actually really through self-sacrifice. It's just about what Jesus is to do on the cross. And so it's making a statement that if you call yourself Christian, it really is this life of cutting out your ego so that you can really love other people. The problem is not the guy that doesn't recognize your authority. The problem is your ego is in control. And the same point is made in the first reading. First reading, very odd. It's from Moses. Um, would have been, you know, over a thousand years before the apostles where Moses, 11 months after they're freed, there's just too many people for Moses to take care of. And so this is the beginning of organized religion. And God says, this is what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to come down, the Holy Spirit's going to come down in this cloud and take part of Moses' spirit, this is actually an ordination, take part of Moses' spirit and pass it among the 70 elders in the tent. And so that's the beginning of organized religion. Now, just this will remind me of something, so I'm putting on pause. This is a squirrel comment. Um, you know my friend who's a Buddhist? Um, like, he hates when people say, oh, I'm a Buddhist. I'm not for organized religion. Buddhism is organized. You know, he lived in a monastery. It's through monasteries and these monks taking vows that Buddhism passed on. That horrible um, um, earthquake in Asia, you know, without organized religion, you can't get supplies and help to help other people. So, like, even him, it dries him up the wall when he says, oh, I'm not for organized religion. How do you help people who are suffering without it? Um, does everything have to go through the government? Anyhow, um, so God seems to be for organized religion. He, takes part of Moses' spirit, passes it along. But then there's this amazing problem that um, Joshua catches two people, and their names are Medad and Eldad, very important. And they're prophesying. And he goes back to Moses and says, same thing as apostles, you tell them to stop. And Moses says, no, are you jealous for me? And when he says that, jo Joshua is just jealous because 
His ego is in charge. And Moses says, wouldn't it be great if all the people were like that? But the amazing part is this. The Holy Spirit blew a little bit farther than Joshua wanted. The Holy Spirit blew a little bit farther into Medad and Eldad. And the names Edad and Mel- Medad in um, Hebrew, Eldad means loved by God. Medad means uh, friendship and love. The idea is that outside of the tent of religion, God's Holy Spirit still blows there. And there are, even to this day, Medads and Eldads, people that are loved by God, people who are in this friendship with God, doing God's work outside the tent. As I said, God can work in and through religion and also outside of religion, organized religion. And Joshua is only jealous because his ego needs to be stroked. My only point being is if you claim to be a follower of Christ, then the church does not have a monopoly on Christ. Uh, Religion doesn't own God. God owns us. And rather than get upset that, you know, um, the apostles are upset because somebody's doing good, they should rejoice that God can work even outside religion. Why not rejoice? And to claim that you're a Christian really means that, yes, our life is about cutting out our ego, cutting out the hand or the eye that is just bigoted or or ego. So in the end, maybe all of us could be like Pope Francis. After a life of cutting out our own ego, all that's really left is that we just love everybody. I think thou make converts. And so together...